Good morning. morning. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Wonderful to gather together this morning. Welcome. Welcome this morning. Welcome to First Christian Reformed Church in South Holland. I'd like to extend a special welcome for those of you who are visiting with us. We trust you'll find this place to be a house where we gather around God's Word and we seek a blessing from Him. What a joy it is to gather together here the first thing we do on Christmas morning. A lot of us have Various things planned for the rest of the day, time with family and friends, but it is important to worship God on days like today. And we do this each Lord's Day, but uh, especially today we are remembering the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ. This year, Christmas Sunday and Christmas Day are the same day. Normally you have uh, Sunday after the fourth week of Advent, we call that Christmas Sunday, and then oftentimes we gather also on Christmas Day. That's the same day this year, so today either has to be twice as good or twice as long. So we'll find out which one in a little bit. We are, we are delighted to worship our God. And what a privilege it is as he calls us to worship him, as he allows us to worship him. We who are, are sinful rebels, he welcomes us to himself. And so as we prepare to do that on this Christmas morning, let's take a few moments in quiet prayer and reflection as we prepare to worship our God. Amen. Just a couple of announcements before we get started this morning. Our evening service tonight will be joining with Cottage Grove Christian Reform Church just down the street, so that's at 5.30. And then next week, we'll have our regular services on Sunday, 9.30 and 5.30. And there will be no New Year's Eve service. So Saturday night, no service. But the next day, 9.30 and 5.30 are regular services. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 98. Psalm 98, and we're going to do it as a responsive reading in our Red Trinity hymnal. It's found in the back, page 820. Responsive reading, Psalm 98. I will read, and you can respond wherever it's written in the bold lettering. Page 820, the back of our Red Trinity hymnal. If you are able, please stand, and let's hear our great God call us to worship him. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. The Lord has made his salvation known. And revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples of Amen. As part of the reading of God's holy word, let's turn back in our Red Trinity hymnal to number 214 and sing together, Angels We Have Heard on High.
Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot save or rescue ourselves from this sin-stricken world. We need help, and our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. He greets us with his grace and calls us his own. Receive then the Lord's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We teach ourselves about God's goodness through the rhythms of grace. And the constant posture for the Christian is one of faith and repentance, believing in Jesus and repenting of our sins, and seeing how we fall short day after day after day in each hour. And so, brothers and sisters, let's join our hearts together as we bow in prayer in a prayer of confession of sin. Let's pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and the desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health or goodness in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. And spare those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O merciful Father, that we may hereafter, for his sake, live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. The grace of God is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so here then, the assurance of pardon this morning for all those who believe in Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He is the Savior of the world. He is the Savior of mankind. And so look to him. Trust in him. If you seek salvation in Jesus Christ and in him alone, there is forgiveness in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We sing this morning a song of assurance in the words of Psalm 103, verses 1 through 11. It's found in your bulletin. Praise God, my soul with all my heart, a tune that perhaps you know it's fairly easy to learn. And so we'll remain seated and sing the three verses of this psalm, Psalm 103. Merciful and kind 
to anger slow and full of grace. He will not constantly reprove or in his anger hide his face. He does not punish our misdeeds or give our sins their just reward. How great is love as I as have towards all those who fear the Lord. We serve a God who is merciful and kind. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And in his forgiveness, he calls us to live a life of gratitude and obedience to him. And so here then, the reading of the law as it's found in Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. And we respond together the song of thanksgiving, a fitting song for Christmas. God came to earth, the fullness of God was in a helpless babe of Jesus Christ. And so let's stand together with taking the insert in our bulletin and sing in Christ alone.
Thank you, choir. Let's bow our hearts in a time of prayer this morning. Gracious God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our hearts praise you for the wonder of your love in Jesus. He is heaven's darling, but is for us the incarnate, despised, rejected, crucified sin bearer. In him your grace has almost outgraced itself. In him your love to rebels has reached its height. Oh, that we would love you with a love like this, Father. Our hearts are stone. Please melt them with your love. Our hearts are locked. Let love be the master key to open them. Oh, Father, we adore you for your great love and the gift of Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus, we bless you for laying down your life for us. Oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you for revealing to us this mystery. Great God, let your Son see in us the purpose of his cross. Bring us away from our false trusts to rest in him and in him alone. Let us not be so callous to his merit, that which he earned for us in his life and his death and his resurrection. Let us not become hardened so as not to love him. Let us not become indifferent to his blood, to not desire his cleansing. Lord Jesus, Master, Redeemer, Savior, come and take whole possession of us, for that is your right by your purchase. In the arms of love, enfold and subdue our willful spirits. Please take and sanctify and use every faculty. We are not ashamed of our hope, nor has our confidence led us into confusion. We trusted you regarding our innumerable sins, which were like the mountains of the earth. And you have cast them behind your back in your goodness and your faithfulness and your everlasting love. We trusted you when evils encompassed us and you brought us out into a wealthy place. We trusted you in an hour of distress. And Father, for all the distresses we have had this past year, we reflect back and we think and we see your goodness. And so we pray even this morning for our brother Tom Heisman in his hour of distress and pray that your healing hand would be upon him. For Father, you did not fail us, though our faith trembled. O God of the eternal covenant, O God of the restored possession who was purchased, who, that purchased for us on the tree, God of the effectual call, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we adore your glory honor, majesty, power, and dominion forever. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. We take our offering this morning, come around twice. The first for Wycliffe Bible Translating, second will be for our general fund.
we prepare ourselves before we gather around God's word this morning by going in our blue Psalter hymnal to number 331. O come, O come, Emmanuel. We'll stand together and sing the first four verses, verses one through four. Let's stand together and sing. Luke 2, verses 1 through 20, Luke chapter 2, page 1590, in the pew bottles in front of you. This is God's word, our authority in faith and in life. Please give your attention to its reading. Luke 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, 
and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God endures forever. I came across a poem this week entitled The Incarnation and the Passion, and I'll read you a few lines from it. It says this, speaking of Jesus Christ coming and, and taking off the heavenly glory that he had from all eternity. It says this, Lord, when thou didst thyself undress, laying by thy robes of glory, to make us more, thou wouldst be less, and became a woeful story. Brave worms and earth that thus could have a God enclosed within your cell. Your maker pent up in a grave. Life locked in death. Heaven in a shell. The incarnation, of course, refers to Jesus coming to earth. Becoming man. Taking human nature upon himself. The passion refers to the sufferings of Christ. And particularly the cross. The author here, Henry Vaughn, is, is drawing a line of connection between the two, the incarnation and the passion, the birth of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ. Perhaps to some this seems odd. Christmas is joy and celebration and good, happy feelings. Why darken it all by discussing the cross or suffering? But what we must begin to see, brothers and sisters, this Christmas, if we have not already begun to see it, is that Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter are all so closely interwoven. It is all part of God's mission which he gave to his son, Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is all about. Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter. All part of the Father's mission to the Son. Centrally, in these 20 verses this morning, what I want us to see is that the birth of Jesus in the manger begins the journey of suffering for Jesus that will arrive at Calvary and the cross. That's what the birth in the manger is all about. We unpack this through three ideas in our text. That Jesus Christ was born in a manger, that he was born to reign, and that he was born to die. Born in a manger, born to reign, and born to die. So first then, this Savior born in a manger. Two things I'd like to specifically focus on regarding the birth of Jesus Christ and how we learn more about him through his birth. Two things, the manger and the inn. The manger and the inn. The, the angels, of course, say to the shepherds, this will be a sign for you. You'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. What we need to ask ourselves is, what do the angels mean by this word sign? Do they say, do they mean by the word sign that this is how you know it will be Jesus? Look for these two things. Or do these signs communicate to us something deeper about who Jesus is? Do we learn something about Jesus by the fact that he was born in a manger? That he was not in an inn, that he was wrapped in swaddling cloths? I think that's the best way to understand that word sign. Yes, the shepherds will know that it is Jesus because he is lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloths. But also, those things teach them something about who Jesus is, and they teach us something about who Jesus is. This use of the word sign is well attested in Scripture. 
that God gives his people a sign, and that not only proves that what God is saying is true or will be fulfilled, but it teaches them something about what God is doing. This is exactly what happens in Isaiah 37. Hezekiah is king of Judah, and the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, comes upon Judah and takes all of their cities. One of the servants of the king of Assyria stands up in the midst of God's people, and he calls them to come out from Canaan. He says, the king of Assyria is going to give you much more than your God ever has. Abandon your faith in this God. Trust in the king of Assyria. He's, of course, mocking the God of Israel. That's what's going on. When Hezekiah hears of this, he tears his clothes and he, he sends word to Isaiah. and He asks Isaiah to intercede, to pray to God on behalf of the people of Israel. This is what Isaiah does. And God hears the prayers of Isaiah. And through Isaiah, he assures Hezekiah that he will drive the king of Assyria out of the land for his blasphemy. That he has heard the cries of his people and that he will come and he will rescue them. God gives Hezekiah a sign to confirm this. He tells Hezekiah to not plant any crops for two years, to only harvest and eat what grows of itself. We have some professional and hobby farmers in the congregation, and so I didn't want to talk out of turn, out of ignorance, and so I checked before I preached this sermon what actually happens, and I I just confirmed it, that you know, when you're harvesting, some seed falls along in your field. And if you do nothing, generally speaking, there will be some crops that sprout up, just of themselves. And that's what God commands Hezekiah to do. For the next two years, don't plant any of your crops. Just let whatever comes out of the ground grow of itself. And then the third year, plant new crops. Increase your farming plan. Increase all of your vineyards. This is the sign that God gives to Hezekiah. And not only is God saying that I'm going to rescue my people, that I've heard your cry, but it communicates to us something about what God is doing. It shows us that God is saving his people as his remnant. That is a smaller part of the whole. That's what those first two years signify. And then, of course, the third year of a flourishing crop of Hezekiah allowing his servants to plant in all of his fields and even increase shows us that God is going to allow his people to put down roots in their land and to flourish. You see, the sign shows that God, what God says is true, but it communicates something about what God is doing. And so with all of that in mind, what does God mean by giving the sign of the manger? You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. This will be a sign unto you. Well, I think to figure out what this sign means, we need go no further than the book of Isaiah. One of the most important books, of course, for understanding the Old Testament. And at the beginning of the prophet Isaiah, In chapter 1, verse 3, the first prophecy that Isaiah speaks, he says this, The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its lord's manger, but Israel does not know me. My people do not understand me. So when a donkey knows that it is his lord who fills his manger, it's his master who fills his manger or his feeding trough, what does he recognize? He's recognizing that it is his owner who feeds and sustains and cares for him. That's what Isaiah is saying in chapter 1, verse 3. The donkey who who knows his Lord's manger, he knows that it is the Lord who feeds and sustains and cares for him. And this is exactly what Israel had forgotten in their history. They had forgotten that God was their provider and their sustainer. Just as a caring owner of an animal feeds and cares for his own, so the Lord had fed and sustained Israel. And they forgot that. But now, the Messiah sent to rescue them is born in a manger. Why? To remind them that the Lord is the provider of his people. To remind them that the Lord is the sustainer of his people. To remind them and to show them that God has heard their cry. And he is now giving for them a blessing that is unlike any blessing they have had in the past. 
God will provide a way for salvation. God has heard your cry. And he has now sent this Messiah and he is laying there in a manger because God is your provider, because God is your sustainer, because the greatest blessings you will ever receive come from the hand of the Lord. Just as God fed Israel in the wilderness and has fed them with his spiritual nourishment, so so now God sends them the true bread of life from heaven, Jesus, born in a manger. Second thing is the inn, the inn. In verse 7, we see that the inn is named in direct contrast to the manger. She laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. We've all seen Christmas plays where Mary and Joseph go from motel to motel and bang on the door and they're looking for a room and all the owners shoo them away. There's no room. Nobody ever wants the role of the innkeeper in the, the Christmas play because you're, you have to be the one who's, who's mean and nasty. And Luke doesn't really give us these kinds of details, but the inn functions as an important sign. It communicates to us something about what God is doing in Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 8, the prophet is pleading with the Lord because Jeremiah has seen what everyone else has forgotten, that God is their provider and their sustainer, that if you're not trusting in the Lord, you don't have a hope. And so the prophet intercedes on behalf of all the people, and he says this, Jeremiah 14, verse 8, O you, hope of Israel, its Savior in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who lodges in an inn? What is it that Jeremiah is saying? He's saying to God, don't be like a traveler in our land. Don't come to us and stay in an inn and then leave. We can't have your presence coming and going. We need you in our midst all of the time. And I believe the reason Luke is telling us that Jesus was not staying in an inn, that he was lying in a manger is because he is showing us that finally and fully God has answered this prayer of Jeremiah. Jesus Christ, in his person and in his work, is God saying, I have come to be with you from this point on and forevermore. He did not stay in an inn. He was not some traveler, not a sojourner in the land. He came unto his own as if to say, I am here with you for good. God is now in your midst. This, brothers and sisters, is the good news of Christmas. Israel's sin, our sin and rebellion would always have had God's God's presence coming and going. He always would have needed to to have been like a sojourner around us because of our sin and because of our rebellion and because of our wickedness. But in Jesus Christ, God is with us forevermore, born in a manger. He's also born to reign He's born to reign. God with us, salvation, blessing. This is what the angels announced to the shepherds in their song. Verse 11 shows us three very important titles about Jesus. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. With one person being all of these things, it's no wonder they sing a song of rejoicing. Gloria in excelsis Deo. That's, of course, Latin. Not what the angels were speaking, presumably, when they first said, Uh, this song of rejoicing. They were speaking Norwegian, if you must know, but (laughs) there is in this song of rejoicing a common theme that is seen in the Old Testament and in the book of Psalms. It bears especially close resemblance to the Psalms of enthronement, which we find uh, mostly in Psalms 96 through 99. We use one of these for our call to worship today. For example, the beginning of Psalm 96 says this, Let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it, then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. What is it that the angels declare in their song? That the King of kings has come to earth, that we are to respond in worship and praise and adoration of this King. He is to be adored by all creation even to the farthest reaches of the earth. This is Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. It's an army of angels. It's no wonder that the shepherds were afraid. And it would have been completely natural for the shepherds to be afraid. If they knew anything about their Old Testament, 
if they knew anything about the Psalms of enthronement, then they, then they would have known that when God comes, he comes in judgment. Just after the passage that we read in Psalm 96, it continues this way. For God comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. When the day of the Lord comes, when his anointed comes, what does he bring with it? He brings judgment. Glory to God in the highest. But how is it that God is glorified? God is glorified in the judgment of the wicked. God is glorified in the destruction of evil. John the Baptist, who paved the way for Jesus, what is it that he said? The axe is laid to the root of every wicked tree. And then he was confused when Jesus came forgiving and healing and pronouncing blessing. The host of heavenly beings come praising God, glorifying God, but they do not announce judgment. They announce what? Peace. Peace on earth. Why is this? We find it in Jesus Christ. We find it in the life that he lived. For though king of kings, though worthy of all praise and all adoration, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Why was Jesus born? We read in verse 7, Mary gave birth. She wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. This verse to me is so strangely and eerily similar to Luke 23, 53, where we read about a man named Joseph who asked Pilate if he could care for the body of Jesus after he was crucified. And so at the birth we read that Jesus gave birth to a son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger. And in Luke 23, we read this, that this man, Joseph, took it down, the body of Jesus Christ from the cross. He took it down and wrapped him in linen shrouds and laid him in a tomb. He took it down, wrapped him in linen shrouds, and laid him in a tomb. Luke is telling us that Jesus Christ was born to die. His birth has a straight line of connection to his death. He was born to die. He was born to die. And this life purpose of Jesus tell us why the angels came and they announced peace rather than judgment and why Jesus went around healing and forgiving sin rather than judging it. Because Jesus came to live his life to deal with the wrath of God. The wrath of God. Some of you may be thinking, the wrath of God on Christmas? Yes, Christmas is about the wrath of God. This is hard to fathom for many people who live in a world, and sadly, oftentimes, a church that is, that is stuck in sentimental thinking about God. So many people who think that God is love, and what his love means is that it prevents him from punishing anyone. It prevents him from allowing suffering. We've seen this permeate the thinking of so many people in the world and so many people in the church. And so many people are unwilling to stare into the most serious and darkest realities of life with any honesty. This life becomes about always being comfortable, embracing our comfort and avoiding suffering and, and pushing the suffering of the world away from us because we cannot deal with it. This was the driving force behind a group of, of, of Catholic bishops who wrote a pastoral letter recently regarding Canada legalizing assisted suicide. And this group of bishops wrote a letter saying that it, it may be permissible and even desirable for the people within their communion, within their church, to seek this kind of alleviation of suffering. Why is the culture of death permeated our culture? Why has a child who, who is in the womb, who is found to have health problems, why is it that so many people think that that child would be better off if it did not have life? Why is it that so many people, when they come to the excruciating parts of the end of their life, which is so hard for so many people, why is it that all of a sudden we're thinking that it would be better off if this person were not living? 
That's where you arrive when you believe that God would not will or allow the suffering of anyone. If God does not allow suffering, then death is a legitimate solution to the problem of suffering. And so what do we say to that, brothers and sisters? What can we say? Does God ever will the suffering of someone in order to bring about an end result that is better than before? Does God ever do that? Has that ever happened? Friends, we need look no further than the manger. We need look no further than Jesus Christ, where we see the only and the most beloved Son of God stepping onto the road of suffering. That's what happens when he is born. He is stepping onto his road of suffering. And he stepped onto that road of suffering by the will of God to bear the wrath of God for sinners. It's the great mystery of Christmas. We see in this story all of this amazement going on. The shepherds tell everyone around them and everyone around them is amazed. The shepherds are amazed and Mary is storing up all of these things in her heart, wondering, pondering, what's really going on? What is God doing through this miraculous birth and through all of these things happening? Wise men are coming from the east. Shepherds are coming. What is happening? What is going on? All of these things unfolding in Jesus' life that would not be understood until the cross and the resurrection. What's the driving force behind all of it? What causes it to happen? Jesus Christ was born to die, but, but what compelled him to do it? The love of God. The love of God. Henry Vaughan's poem, which we began with this morning, continues, and it says this. It says this regarding Jesus. Ah, my Lord, what couldst thou spy in this impure, rebellious clay that made thee thus resolve to die for those that kill thee every day? Oh, what strange wonders could thee move to slight thy precious blood and breath. Sure it was love, my Lord, for love is only stronger far than death. Why did the Son embrace suffering? Why did the Father send the Son to suffer but for love? But for love. Maybe you've thought about this before, but if you really take all of the data that we have from Scripture... Everything we know about the Father and the Son, you realize that you would expect John 3.16 to read differently. You would expect John 3.16 to actually be the exact opposite. You know, you, you read about how much the Father loves the Son. You know how John 3.16 should go. It should say this. For God so loved the Son that he gave him the world. For God so loved the Son that he gave him the world. The world. That's how it should go, and that's what it seems to say at the end of chapter 3, right? The Father has loved the Son, and He's given all things into His hand. But what does John 3, 16 say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. For God so loved the world that He gave the Son. Beloved, I can't offer you a good explanation of how or why that happens, other than to say that it is the love of of God. It is the fact that God had love for his creation, for sinners. And he wanted to save them, and so he sent the Son. He sent his beloved Son. In light of all of this, may we never think that God's wrath against sin is too great, or that God would never will anyone to suffer when he poured out his wrath on his beloved Son. And he willed that his Son would suffer. This is why his birth is good news for us and not judgment for the world. The Psalms of Enthronement say he comes in judgment. But the message of Christmas is that God bears his own wrath in his Son. The judgment is poured out upon the Messiah himself. The judgment is poured out upon his beloved Son. God loved the world so much that he made a way to satisfy justice. And that way was Jesus Christ. Friends, I'll close with these thoughts. I know life is hard. I know you have doubts. I know you have fears. I know you have worries. And I know at times you cry out, why? But this morning, this Christmas, take all of your doubts, 
Take all of your fears, take all of your worries, gather them all, everything that would make you cry out why, and bring them this morning to the manger. But don't stay there. Because out from that old cattle stall, there is a road, a road that leads straight to Calvary. And that is the road of Jesus' suffering. And follow him. Follow him on that road. Follow him as Jesus heals the sick and gives sight to the blind and he teaches in the temple and he rides into Jerusalem. And follow Jesus on his road of suffering as he stands before a mortal man who condemns him to death. And follow Jesus on the road to the cross. And as he hangs there in agony, which is agony unlike anything felt before because he is bearing the wrath of God for everyone who would believe. And as he hangs there in agony and you stand there holding all of those things, your doubts, your fears, your worries, everything that would make you cry out why, lay them at the foot of the cross. Lay them at the foot of the cross as the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, the one who was loved before the world was, the one who was the greatest treasure the Father had ever known. And think of that as Jesus Christ, the God-man, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who had existed forever, as Jesus Christ cries out, Why? Why have you forsaken me? We can never say that God's wrath is too great because we only understand God's wrath in the message of the gospel, in the message of Jesus Christ, that God poured out his wrath on his eternally existent and beloved son. May we never say that God's wrath against sin is too great. May we never say that God would not will suffering when he willed that his son would suffer so that we might be reconciled to him. Who has known the power of thine anger and wrath, says Moses in Psalm 90. Who can know it? Who has known the power of thine anger? Jesus Christ has known the power of God's anger and wrath. He was born in a manger. He was born to reign. He was born to die. Love, the only thing greater than death. Good, the only thing greater than evil. This is Jesus Christ, the one who was born so that he might die, so that he might bear our sins, reconcile us to God, who has known the power of thine anger and wrath. Who can stand? Jesus Christ has known, and Jesus Christ can stand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for redemption. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for reconciliation and blessings that flow far as the curse is found to the very depths of the darkest corners of our soul to the farthest reaches of our world. For we know that his blood is greater than any sin. For we know that your love is greater than death. For we know that your goodness is greater than our evil. Thank you for saying yes to us in Jesus Christ. Amen. We respond in song. Our blue Psalter hymnal number 339, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let's stand together and sing.
Merry Christmas. Have a great day in Christ. Receive the benediction of our God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.